to welcome you to the 31st annual St. Lucie County Science Fair. This is the regionals for um, our district, and we're excited to have you here. And behind me, you will see the middle school science projects upstairs on the second floor here at the Kite Center at IRSC. We have the high school, the advanced level projects that you'll have a chance to see throughout um, this video. And there are a numerous amount of different topics that are covered from behavioral sciences to chemistry, physics, biology, plants, um, you name it, these kids have covered a, just a, a gamut of topics. And it, it's an amazing thing to see what these kids have researched and found out about different things. Many of them have even created patents or applied for patents. So um, all the different things that you'll get a chance to see through these next few minutes, um, it's, it's a joy to see what students are doing here in St. Lucie County and what our students here are accomplishing each and every day through their education. I'm Mariana Jemison and I'm from Mosaic Digital Academy. I'm Katherine Bigner and I'm from Mosaic Digital Academy. Our project is which color of gummy bears absorb the most red laser light. So what we did is we stacked gummy bears sideways and we put the red laser light through the gummy bears to see which color of gummy bear will absorb the light the fastest. Our hypothesis was that the clear gummy bear will absorb the most. Um, after our experiment we got the results. So the green gummy bear absorbed the most while the red and the clear took more to absorb the same amount of red laser light. Um, this is because green light uh, <laughs> absorbs red and reflects blue and yellow. Clear, um, because it does not have any color, it can't absorb color, but it transmits light. And red absorbs green and reflects red. So our conclusion is that our evidence was not supported by hypothesis. Our evidence was that the green gummy bear absorbed the most razor light, and our hypothesis was wrong. Um, hello, my name is Vanessa Aguilera, and I'm from Forest Grove Middle School. And my project was about what type of fabric heats up the quickest. And my hypothesis was that the velvet fabric would heat up the quickest because of its thick composition. And um, to try and find out which one heats up the quickest, I put them out. Uh, put them outside for two hours, and then came back and wrapped them around in a thermometer to check the temperature. And in conclusion, the hypothesis was not supported because both the tool and the velvet heated up the quickest. Hi, I'm Madison Davis um, from Lincoln Park Academy, and this is my Project Fast Acting Leaf. Um, so what I did is I took uh, liquid gels, caplets, tablets, and gel caps from the brand Aleev um, to try and figure out which would relieve your pain quicker. So I used a um, I used a white vinegar to as my controlled substance for the stomach acid to simulate it, um, and then I watched and as, as they dissolved um, the. Caplets actually dissolved the quickest, which was not my hypothesis. I believed that the liquid gels would because they were liquid. Uh, the average for all of them is right there. And as you can see, caplets dissolved quickest. Uh, um, through my experiment, my hypothesis was proven incorrect as the caplets dissolved the quickest. I'm Reese Wigglesworth, I'm from Lincoln Park Academy, and my project is about which water is safest, what type of water is safest to drink. And so what I did was got bought different companies of water and tested each type to see which one, what materials were in them and which ones were safer. I thought that tap water would contain the least amount of harmful chemicals, and that was right. Um, I found the pH, total hardness, iron, copper, lead, nitrate, uh, fluoride, and free 
drinking chloride. Dip the strip and water to s and whatever color it turned would based on how much of that chemical was in the water. My name is Catherine and I'm I go to Okamic. My project is about angles and how um they could change the speed of a car at certain angles. I believe the larger that the ink sign at the bottom of the ramp, the, fa the faster the car would go. I believe this because the research that I found to show the greater ink sign will produce more speed for the car. The car speed will change at different ink kinds of angles. This experiment demonstrates the greater the incline, the faster the car would travel because the farther the distance, less time. Um, the hypothesis was proven correct as we increase the incline, the wind will the faster the car went. There were five different inclines in this experiment. This experiment does follow Newton's laws. It's the fact that the car moves as greater speed with the angle of the measure. The experiment did not test an angle that did not result in motion. This, the experiment could be concluded using other angles to see if the point w at which incline of the ramp does not affect the speed. The real world applications could be that when creating roller coasters that engineers or designers could move from high speed incline with a larger angle the low speed with a lower angle. This also can also be applied when building bridges and designing mountain roads that smaller the incline with the less speed that water will be built when designing from a high point the varying degrees that could be used more applications where the descent of an object needs to be My name is Darian Brown. I'm from Lincoln Park Academy. And my project is off of the physics of spinning tops. F physics is, it's a study of science. And there are many ways to present it more of. In, in my presentation, we use it through the popular toy called Beyblades. We spin a similar Beyblade with different tips to understand how the tip of it can change the physics of it. These three tips were the ones that spun, spin for the longest amount of time. This hat, this one has metal in it. Metal is a known for being a very heavy element. And weight can, be, can determine a certain amounts of inertia. Then we have this, flugel. Flugel, it's a tip with propeller blades. If a propeller blade, if there are enough propeller blades spinning at a certain amount of time, they can allow the object to fly. But in this case, we're putting it on the bottom of a, of a spinning top. And the propeller blades are thin, allowing it to have better air resistance, which could stop the Beyblades from spinning. That's why Flugel's good. When it cuts through the air, it lowers the amount of air resistance, pushing it back. Fusion. It's a tiny tip, like, it's a really small tip. So, it allows it to have a little friction from the, from the surface that it's spinning on. And the friction slows it down. So, with less friction, it allows it 
to spin for a longer time. What I did with my project was I took the tips and experimented with them. As you can see, weight did the best by a very great amount of time. And there are diff many different tips that I could have used. Things like this tip called Hunter, it has rubber on it and it's flat. These components uh, make it so that it has lots of friction, causing it to spin for longer amounts of time. Well, no, shorter amounts of time. And the thing is, the thing when when something has a lot of friction, it slows down faster. That's why Hunter was similar to the tip Extreme. Extreme is a similar tip, but with a bigger idea. Like Hunter, it's a smaller flat tip. And Hunter, I mean Extreme, is a bigger flat tip. Okay. This causes the friction of Hunter to gain more friction. That's why Extreme did slightly better than Hunter. So what did you base it on being fast? The thing is, I don't, there were only three tips with rubber on them that I had. Those tips were Extreme, Hunter, and Merge. Merge didn't do so well either. It didn't get as high as all the other tips, but it didn't go low. The reason being is that in the middle of the merge tip, there is a piece of plastic that if it stays in a certain position, it lies on top of that plastic, which gives it a nice stamina boost, allowing it to spin for a longer amount of time. Then the other two, they don't have plastic on the bottom, so they're not able to spin on the plastic meaning that the rubber would be exposed to the surface, causing friction to be guaranteed by the rubber. In conclusion, I had a hypothesis that the tip named Edge would win. It would have the most amount of stamina and would spin for a long amount of time. The thing is, it didn't because Although the tip is very thin and it caused it to spin for a decent amount of time, it did not make it here. It got fourth place out of 13 tips. The reason being is that these ones have better momentum, friction, and air resistance to allow them to spin for longer amount of, longer amount of time. Although the hypothesis Although the hypothesis was incorrect, this can be used in understanding how physics work. And physics, like I said, is a field of science. Understanding this field of science could help us understand how to use spinning objects, spinning horizontally. And spinning horizontally, you, yeah. And, that's about it. Uh, my name's Ethan Marcano, and I'm from Alapata Flats K-8. And my board was basically on um, if I change the temperature of a tennis ball, will it affect the rebound height? I dropped each of the um, tennis balls from 100 inches, and um, uh, I made a hot group, cold group, and then I had my normal room temperature tennis balls. And based on my experiments, the hot tennis balls had the higher rebound, and I think that is because um, the maybe the molecules were more shaken and it had more energy in it, and that's what caused it to affect the bounce. And the cold um, tennis balls uh, just bounced less and less the colder it got, and that just proves that um, the, the temperature was more um, hotter or more hot. It would. Um, really like affects just the rebound overall and the room temperature just stayed it right around the same part and the cold just really affected the change like it went from 42 30 43 and then 45 it kept going 
lower and lower and lower and the hot went higher and higher and higher and yeah the temperature really did affect the whole entire part and for the cold I had just put it in a big um, cooler of ice and for the hot I had just wrapped it around in a heating pad and made and heated it up to the highest setting and just made it really hot to a point where like it was like melting apart and stuff so yeah temperature really did affect it based on right here and I had did the whole um, height in inches so yeah it was really effective on the heat. Uh, my name is Gabriel Hardman and I'm from Palm Point in Tradition and um, this is my project I did it on uh, if herbs grow better in water or soil so basically what I did was I planted th uh, six no three herbs in uh, both gardens a natural garden and a liquid garden and the herbs included basil thyme mint and and that's it and um, my hypothesis was it would grow better in the, the natural because it's it's natural and it has nutrients and you just can't recreate it. But um, I was wrong because there was an unseen variable and the it got dug up by an animal. And um, so all my materials I used, I used uh, all the herbs. I used a garden, uh, a camera, water, and then make sure you have sunlight. The purpose it was to make see which one grew better in which uh, which garden and um, my procedure it was um, first I planted both herbs in um, in both gardens at the same time or at the same day and um, I watered them every Saturday for seven weeks the project went on for seven weeks and um, so I watered them and took pictures every Saturday. And um, I measured every Saturday. I did all that every Saturday. And, um, and then at the end of the seven weeks, I harvested. And I measured the stems and all, the, um, all of the, the leaves and stems. And then I uh, jotted it down on the piece of paper. And um, that was basically my, my project. I did, my name is John Donnelly, I'm from LPA, 7th grade, but I did a wireless electricity project with, inspired by Nikola Tesla's work years ago. I did a test with a 1-9 volt battery to see how far it could light up a light bulb from this Tesla coil, which may, light is a wireless electricity to, and then I used an 18 watt battery, two nine volts, to measure for, see if it would light it up at 30 centimeters. Where I did with the nine volt, I see if it saw if it would light up at 15 centimeters. And then I, what I did here is I, after I finished my initial test, I tried to see how far it could go. And the 9 volt could maximum get actually out close to 24 centimeters. And the 18 volt was able to reach 50 centimeters distance from the Slayer Exciter Tesla coil, which is a more advanced version of Nikola Tesla's original Tesla coil, which instead of using a spark gap, it uses sort of like it works like a capacitor that it stores up energy through the coil and then releases it at a wireless energy field out of this top load here. It, my project took me roughly three months to complete, considering that this I did not make this myself. I had I bought this. But I am working on making my own, which is about this tall. And I intend to further my work by seeing if I can make one that charges phones and other electronic devices while you're walking around. My name is Megan Brooks, and I go to 
Lincoln Park Academy. So my project was on different colors of light and how they affect plants. So basically what I did was I built wooden boxes and I covered them in colored cellophane and I placed three lima bean plants in each box and then after three weeks I measured the height of each plant and I averaged them out and compared the averages and the red ended up growing the most. My hypothesis was incorrect. I originally thought the blue would grow the most, but the red ended up growing the most, and I watered them every day, every other day. the highest turnout rate we've had in the last three years. We have 258 students. We have every school but one participating. We have more high school students this year than we've had as long as I've been the science fair coordinator, which for the last five years. And a special thank you for the school-based administrators, the school-based science fair coordinators, and most importantly, the science teachers within the district to make this event possible. Exactly. You know, the students that I've talked to so far this morning are just so complimentary and appreciative of what their teachers have allowed them to do in working on these science projects. So a lot of kadoos go to those science teachers and the admin, as well as the kids. Their, their passion is just, it, it just gives me great, great hope for the future in the way they have chosen a topic that's important to them and really taking something and taking it to new levels. So, you know, Paul, one of the other things that I found really interesting this morning in the judges' breakfast, um, we have a lot of new judges, yes, a lot of we do. new community a lot support, of which is really, really important for these kids to see as well. And a special call out and thank you to IRSC who supplied a significant amount of judges this year. Mm -hmm. And they also uh, supplied some mentors, scientists and science teachers to help our students with their science boards. Unfortunately, we had the government shut down and the Department of Agriculture, which helped them in the past, wasn't available this year to help, and IRSE stepped right up and filled the void. So a special call and thank you to Dr. Driven and the staff of IRSE. It shows that our local community is invested in our public school students and, and enabling them to have all the resources possible. So. sun it got each day so we can make sure it was consistent and overall the pots with one plant have the greatest average growth because they had one plant in the pot so it got the most nutrients and my hypothesis was correct. My name is Alyssa and my school name is Alipada Flats. The purpose of my project was to see which would stay fresh longer, organic or non-organic apples. And my hypothesis was that the non-organic apples would stay fresh longer because there's less things in it. Um, my materials were three organic apples, three non-organic apples, a notepad, a, time, a stopwatch, and a pencil. 
So first I gathered I gathered one one organic and one non-organic apple and I put them on my counter at room temperature and then I started my stopwatch and I waited over the days to see to see which which would start on, like getting brown spots on it and then when they got to two or three brown spots then I stopped the stopwatch and I wrote down on the notepad which had like the brown spots first and then I repeated that process two more times to see that my results were accurate and the, my hypothesis was incorrect because the organic apple stayed fresh longer because they had less pesticides than non-organic apples. My name is Henry Ford, and my school and my school is uh, Patter Flats K8. So the reason why the reason why I did this was because I wondered if I could, if I could be able to um so do you think you might have get, get um get other liquids besides water to make other plants grow. And I hypothesized that out of five drinks that I used, that lemonade would make that would make its sprout the fastest and the tallest. But based on my data, my hypothesis was incorrect because the lemonade did not sprout at all. But the Gatorade was the was the winner at five inches at this 10-day um, process. The lemonade somehow didn't grow, um, and also the Coca-Cola did not grow. The, the V8 started growing on day nine and sprouted all the way all the way at two and a half inches. And water sprout, sprouted to three and a half inches. Gatorade started first, then the water, then the V8. He did not grow in the beginning from day from day two or day four, but once but then the Gatorade started at day six. The lemonade had too much acid in it. Even though the water had lemons in it, which would allow it to grow. It would. Um, it had too much acid in it, which did not allow it to grow. But also, the Coca-Cola has carbonation in there, which made which made it not grow either. And it also had too much acid in there. So comparing the Gatorade versus the water, which one grew taller? Um, the Gatorade. The Gatorade grew taller at five inches, and the water was at three and a half inches. Wow. My name is Bradley Holtzman. I'm from LPA. Lincoln Park Academy. So, um, I did my project to see if the fertilizer would help the plants grow bigger so that I could see if it would help maybe slow down starvation if it had a big impact. And then I used radishes and squash for my plants. My hypothesis is that it would help the plants grow bigger. I grew my plants for four weeks and every day I watered them except for the ones on for on Sunday, the ones that were fertilizer plants, I fertilized them instead of watering them. Um, at the end of it, I could tell that um, the fertilizer didn't really help grow the plants much, but it, it did help grow them a little bit. So my conclusion was that after, anal after analyzing the data, the conclusion is that the nitrogen-based fertilizer does not help plants grow bigger. To fully understand how well would require allowing plants to complete growing and procedure their vegetable radishes and squash to determine if the fertilizer helps vegetables grow bigger or the plants to, pr to produce more of the vegetables. So, hi, my name is Aiden and I'm from Okamek. My, my board is on red mango seeds. Uh, I did this because when I when I went to Boulevard Zoo, I found out that uh, the the red mangrove seeds were becoming less because of the hurricanes that were coming. So I, I wanted to see more about it, and I found out that they they produce ten times more oxygen than um, than terrestrial trees, and they have breeding grounds for uh, like critters like crabs, fish, and many others. I. Uh, 
the hypothesis I came up with was I thought that there were I thought that salt water was going to do the best because salt water is where you usually find them growing at. But the but in reality, the distilled water did the best on the growth rate, while the salt water did the best on the root growth rate. And the tap water was between all of them. And uh, the materials I used were the there were nine the nine uh, red mango seeds, nine containers, and many and salinity tester and two gallons of each tap stilled in uh, salt water. The uh, the, uh, the places I searched up were the Brevard Zoo, the uh, the uh, sea the seawater industry, and uh, IRL Florida. And many, uh, the pictures I took were the uh, were how the roots and the leaves were. This is Christian Keo from Westgate K through eight, and this is my project. It's about airflow and how it affects a vehicle's motion. So I discovered that if I take, I made a long vehicle and a short vehicle, and I'd use different angles of the slope to see which one would go the furthest in the wind. So the longest, the longest plane right here went the furthest in the wind than the shortest one. And, uh, and the one, the 90 degree angle, that's the one that also went the farthest. And the ones that go the farthest in the wind, that's the one that has the most drag on the vehicle. And that also is bad because vehicles produce fuel consumption and more fuel consumption used will be more carbon emissions in the atmosphere. So when we took the fan, we tested each each slope five times, and then we went to the next angle. And we did that for both planes. And then the, the results were that the longer vehicle went the farthest, then, and the shorter vehicle went the slowest, the lowest. And that shows that the longer vehicle had more drag than the shorter vehicle, and that's what car designers should use on their vehicles, a, a, sh a shorter slope and a smaller car. So by doing that, it produces less fuel consumption. And where is it? If I were to change my project, I would use a more slippery design, like a different material that is more, has less weight and is more slippery through the air. So that is more car aerodynamically efficient. My name is Nathan Klein and I'm from Westgate K. My project is the, the, does the pitch or the angle of a roof affect the water flow. So what we did was we took three plywood pieces of the same dimensions and we wetted them first so, so there wouldn't be any drag or any absorption of the, the next batch of water we poured down. So we poured down the water and we had three angles, the four twelfths, 2.5 12s and 9 12s. And we poured down five gallons of water down each plywood plywood board at each angle. And we did this three times. And so, and what we, what our results were, were that the 9 12s pitch had the least, I mean, sorry, the fastest average rate of shed, the watershed and the 412s had the slowest rate of watershed. And what I would change is that the, I would add plywood sides onto the original plywood board. So, because when we poured on the water, some water got lost over the sides and I would do more tests and more pitches and angles. And I would also add roofing materials, such as shingles and tiles. Hello, I am Luke Rattoodle from Lincoln Park Academy in eighth grade, and um, I'm here to present my project entitled Accuracy and Timekeeping. The main purpose of my project is to analyze and compare the three main universal timekeeping methods related to astronomy, and to uh, calculate which one is the most consistent and accurate throughout the course of the year. I hypothesize that when calculating the time difference for each uh, for each, uh, for alternating months, the timekeeping method with the most consistency would be the method of standard time. And that is done by calculating the difference 
between Greenwich, England and my hometown location of Fort Pierce. Um, this is a mostly research-based project. Most of the work is done on a computer. Um, and the procedure uh, includes searching for a solar and sidereal time calculator and uh, calculating so solar and sidereal times for Greenwich, England and Fort Pierce and finding the difference uh, for each alternating month of the year. Um, when calculating the average, the highest time deviation from the average difference, we find that sidereal time is the least deviation, followed by solar time and standard time. Uh, standard time uh, has a high, the highest deviation due to the influence of uh, daylight savings time. I concluded from my data that it disproved my hypothesis due to the fact that although standard time could be the most practical and most widely used in society, it displayed the highest deviation when compared to sidereal time and solar time. So far this morning, I've been a judge in the microbiology, which has really been fascinating. I've only had a chance to, to get to the seniors so far. But the what really I appreciate about it is they pick a topic that is personal to them, and yet it also can impact our economic stability here. It can impact further medical research. One young woman was talking about how she used um, her project because she had a family member with TB and she knew that she couldn't do her project around that, but she found a way to look for um, an antibiotic type thing to isolate it and perhaps further that as she got older. So, you know, there's just an awful lot of thought, in it, thought process in it. So I'm, I'm eager for the rest of the day to have an opportunity to get around and, and see more of the projects. And pick up what Mrs. Hawley said. Some of the junior students are extremely passionate and articulate in explaining their project, which is a great stepping stone for their future. I'm Christopher Brick from Forest Grove Middle School and um, my project is called Alkalinity Rising. In it, I, the problem I started off with was that my fish tanks, we, have, we currently own three freshwater fish tanks and maintain them, but the fish tanks had low alkalinity, which is the amount of buffering capacity. In other words, it means that pH can change rapidly if you have low alkalinity. With higher alkalinity, your pH will stay at a steady rate and thus the fish will be safer because they won't have a sudden spike in acidity or it won't become basic too quickly. And so we had low alkalinity. And we, the first idea we thought of was after, Goog after Googling and researching alkalinity, we found out that calcium carbonate, when dissolved, can act as a buffer and thus raise your alkalinity. We also found out that seashells were composed of mostly of calcium carbonate. So we thought that if we got seashells and ground them up finer to increase their surface area, that we could dissolve them quickly in a circulating system. And so we got two um, big box store buckets and combined them with pipes in a pump system. We ran the water over the seashells and strainers which then flowed into the other tank, the hole, the other bucket, the hole. And after it had run for three days, we got it to a safe level, which is 120 parts per millionth in the water. And therefore, we were able to drain it and add it to our fish tank. And it worked and it solved our problem. I'm Sophia Fry. I'm in eighth grade and I go to Mosaic Digital Academy. The title of my project is A New Source of Energy. It uses thermal energy that goes unused from power sources like smokestacks and transformers and uses that heat to boil water using distillation and in thus clean that water. So in my project, there's a heat contraption 
and water goes in and it's being heated and then cleaned. And it's also making new energy at the same time by the steam turning a turbine. Hi, I'm Melissa, and I'm from Treasure Coast High School. I did my project on metro rail systems and their effects on carbon emissions from various populous cities. Um, I focused on New York City, Chicago, and then from Florida, Tampa, and Orlando. Um, I wanted to see if the metro rails had a positive or negative impact on the um, carbon emissions for those states. Um, I mainly did it as a research project due to limitations of I couldn't actually visit many areas that had a metro rail system um, due to financial reasons and different things like different factors like that. I hypothesized that the metro rails would have a positive impact um, on the carbon emissions for a state. What I wanted to ultimately find out would be if it would be a plausible solution for Florida in order to decrease their carbon emissions. Um, what I ended up finding out was that because of Florida's water table being so high, especially in South Florida, because we're basically, we're practically at sea level, um, it would not be practical to do an underground one. However, such as Minneapolis and St. Paul have an above ground metro rail system, we could do one that go, that runs across the state, especially in the greater cities such as Miami, Fort Lauderdale, um, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, Tampa, and Orlando um, to run across the state. We could do a light and above ground railroad system um, to which could impact our uh, lower our carbon emissions as shown by New York City with theirs they have the highest population and yet the second lowest um, carbon emissions it could be attributed to the transportation the availability of a metro rail um, due to their um, differences in what their carbon emissions should be and what they actually are and that's the focus of my project I'm Warren Nelson. I'm from Lincoln Park Academy. I'm in the 10th grade, and this is my project. Um, do you, I tested if sports drinks or natural citrus juices had more electrolytes. I did this project because I'm I'm an athlete. I like to work out. I do with stuff like that, and I use Gatorade and Powerade to supplement um, electrolytes and stuff like that. But Gatorade and Powerade don't really have they don't really have healthy ingredients. They have unhealthy sugars and um, unnatural ingredients within them. So I wanted to see if a natural um, substitute such as orange juice or grapefruit juice would either have just as many or more electrolytes so I could use that instead of um, sports juice. My hypothesis was due to orange juice ingredients such as potassium, that orange juice would have higher electrolytes. To test, to test this, I set up a circuit I cut a five centimeter piece of straw out and I wrapped two 12 centimeter pieces of copper wire to each end of the straw. On one end of the straw, I connected it directly to a multimeter that was set at 200 milliamps. On the other side of the straw, I connected it to a nine volt battery, which is then connected to a multimeter. The circuit was incomplete, so what I did is I dipped the, I dipped the sensor into each liquid. After I dipped it into each liquid, it gave me the current for each of the liquids, the multimeter. Did. I recorded my data here, and in order to get more accurate results, I converted the current into conductance by dividing the current by the volt of the battery. Once I did that, I um, I averaged my data and I um, compared it with the other liquids. What I, my research showed that that the conductance was more reliable, but it also showed that I want to be able to calculate exactly how many electrolytes each one had, what the conductance would show which one had more. Because if the, if the liquid had a higher conductance, that would mean it would have a higher number of electrolytes. So as you can see, the orange juice and the grapefruit juice had the two highs. So it supported my hypothesis, my conclusion supported my hypothesis. The um, orange juice and, and grapefruit juice were the highest, and surprisingly, the Gatorade and the Powerade were the lowest, especially the Gatorade. The grade was the lowest out of all of them, and it was advertised to have a lot of electrolytes. But since then, I've been using um, orange juice when I work out and stuff, 
to replenish electrolytes instead of unhealthy drinks such as um, Gatorade and Powerade. I'm Liberty Juno. I'm from Fort Pierce West with MOA, and for my project, I did the is the pH affects the development of glucose in the process of forming cellulosic ethanol. And to do our project, we formed three different solutions of different pHs with our cellulose enzyme solution. We did pHs of 5.0, 5.5, and 6.0. And in my project, I predicted that the 5.0 pH would produce the most glucose in the project, as our as our enzyme is most notably active at a pH of 4.5. Um, so in our actual project, we incubated them at a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius for 24 hours and monitor them. And once they came out, we used the Benedict indicator solution to test our levels of glucose. And in the projects, um, actually all the pHs came out to be the same. They produce anywhere from 1.6 to 2.5% of glucose with the Benedict indicator solution. Um, so in conclusion, the project didn't necessarily refute nor support my hypothesis, but so we deemed it inconclusive, but we still got the results we wanted to by producing the glucose. I'm Gabriel Mustachillo. I'm representing Treasure Hill Coast High School. I am a junior there, and my project is the effects of beach erosion on the Florida coastline. The purpose behind this is that according to the Florida DEP, approximately 411 miles of Florida coastline is considered critically eroded. And the rationale behind this is that when the coastline is eroded, a natural cycle of deposition and erosion replaces it, whether it be man-made deposition by dredging or natural deposition by what is brought in from the waves. Now, when the, a critical erosion occurs, animals lose their habitats in the sand dunes as well as businesses and residential areas across the coastline can experience extreme flooding. Now, for my project, I gathered a measuring wheel and a level, and I went to Jensen Beach over the course of two to three months, where I went to five locations and recorded the distance from the sand dunes to the tidal points and the tidal points to the water. Now, what I gather from my data is that approximately 30 to 40 feet of sand and beach area was lost over the course of the two to three months. Now, this would represent a critically eroded problem. Um, so my hypothesis was supported and that if and nothing is done about critical erosion, it will become a larger problem for the state to deal with. Some possible solutions to this is that they could either implement a coastal reef or a coastal sandbar to protect the beach, or they could, a more exciting alternative is to implement a mangrove forest that would help with soil retention, but it is both expensive and takes away from the beach area, which would decrease tourism. Now, some limitations I did face during my project is that I was rained out on one of the days, so that did skew my data, and I also didn't have traveled, so I couldn't go to other beaches, which I'd like to have done. I would have liked to have gone to the Fort Pierce Inlet and down to Juneau Beach to get a wider range of data on the Treasure Coast. So that is my project. Thank you for listening. Okay, um, I'm Christopher. Um, our project is drivetrain and electronic support for Rover Ruckus, and we're from Treasure Coast High School. Uh, so our project is about um, how we can better understand robots and out, out in space and Mars, mainly because that's what the robot was built for. So some of the things the robot can do while it's on Mars is it can go out, get, get sam scientific samples, it can help other robots out, help people out. So if people have like trouble out in the deserts or something, we can go get them or treat them on site with the robot. So some of the difficulties that we have when we're doing a robot is our fuse got on blowing. Uh, because our wires were crossed, were crossed and short circuiting itself. Yeah, that's about it.
Matthew from Lincoln Park Academy. Um, I was trying to figure out the relationship between transistors and sound output because um, in hearing aids they contain transistors and they can be expensive so I thought that determining their relationship would be helpful. So I, I hypothesized that as the transistor amount increases so will the sound output. So I set up three different circuits to test that, one with one, no transistors, one with one, and then another with two transistors. Um, I inputted a sound in each of the groups and I recorded the output sound. I calculated the difference and I repeated that five times. Um, I found the average and I compared them. Um, I found that all the sounds decreased, but they still follow the same trend of increasing from with transistors. Um, that agreed with my hypothesis. However, the the I didn't I didn't hear a sound, which sound which seemed pretty awkward and odd. So I concluded that. Um, the results are inconclusive because although the numbers support the hypothesis, the observations do not. However, um, one could correct the experiment and then the results could be used in, to um, correct and uh, make other sound devices more efficient. Hi, I'm Andrew Johnson from Fort Pierce Central High School, and this is my project, Ring Flinger. So through this project, I demonstrate how a solenoid coil, such as this one found in your everyday refrigerator, washing machine, and dryer can be used to generate enough, enough electricity to make one of these levitate. So in order to do this, we put a iron bolt through the solenoid coil and put this co copper pipe on here. We introduce it to an electric source right here and press the trigger. With power, it generally levitates to about an inch above. So through this project, we figured out that different quality coils will in fact affect the levitation of your apparatus, along with the amount of electricity that's introduced. So the real world application of this is found in your everyday Chinese bullet trains that are traveling at 300 miles per hour and in the military tested rail guns that can shoot a projectile about Mach 6 or 6,000 miles per hour, roughly speaking. So through this project, we demonstrate both how electromagnets and solenoid coils can be used effectively and the technology that they are capable of. My name is Joseph Parr and I'm a high school junior at St. Andrews Episcopal Academy. And my project is about stopping gerrymandering. Now gerrymandering is where a congressional representative draws districts to benefit his or her party. Now what I've aimed to do is to create an equation to evaluate the fairness of the district. So last year when I did this project, I tested it on a geographical base that was completely objective, had nothing to do with districts. This year I tested it on uh, the districts of Pennsylvania because last May they ruled that the districts of Pennsylvania were gerrymandered and that they had to be changed. So I wanted to figure out if they actually did a good job. So what I found was that they in fact did. So the higher the result of the equation, the higher the bias. So this little g right here means the perimeter of the districts without the natural boundaries. N means the length of the natural boundaries times the percentage of the majority and then all of that divided by the area of the district times the minority percentage. So what I found was that they did a good job and that the districts that were inherently biased that were ruled as gerrymandered had very, very high G scores. And then the court drawn districts had mostly G scores that were in the double digits, except for the one district three score, which was in Philadelphia, which really couldn't have anything done about it because population requirements required that a district be a certain number of people. And that concentration of people voted in favor for one party. So what I recognized was that there was a trend between the majority and minority ratio and the G-score, that the higher the majority minority ratio, the higher the G-score. This was present only in the biased district, in the unbiased districts. However, in the gerrymandered districts, that trend is not so present. So what I wanted to find out was why wasn't that trend present there and why it was present there. So I figured out that the geographical values, G and 
and an A had a huge impact in gerrymandered districts because when you have these weird shaped districts that looked like it was drawn by a pre-K-4 student, you have a lot of these, it throws off that trend. So that allowed me to be able to detect systemic gerrymandering. So if that trend is thrown off, it allows me to basically say that this state was in fact gerrymandered as a whole. Hello, my name is Lance Balding. I'm from Fort Pierce Westwood, and this is my project. I did my project on thermoelectric energy. It's a fan that's supposed to run on thermoelectric energy. I use something called a Pelter plate, heating on one side, cooling on the other, and this generates electricity. Throughout my project, what I, I conducted three experiments. The first experiment I conducted used the human hand as heat and the air as just cooling. The second one I conducted was hot water and cold water. And the third one I conducted was using an open flame as, a, as the heat source and cold water as iced water as the cooling source. When I conducted all three, the first two didn't work. There was no rotation in the fan blade. In the, fan blade. in the last one, though, it seemed that because of the great temperature difference, it had resulted in the fan blade to spin. My name is Tegan Panella. I go to MOA, which is a branch off of Westwood, and my project is called Home Run Hitter. So basically my project is about which material baseball bat would hit the ball the farthest between wooden bats and metal bats. Now in the major leagues they use wooden bats. Every other league below that they use metal. So I want to know if it was just a political thing or a scientific thing. So I made a device that would swing the bat at the same force and the same speed and velocity every single time and hit the ball at the same place every single time. And I used the wooden and the metal bat 15 times each and measured the distance in inches. The metal bat actually hit the ball about five feet further every time. And it showed that the metal bats have a lot more force behind them and hit the ball furthest because of how it's made. So I figured out that the reason why they use wooden bats in major leagues is because it gives them a harder chance to hit the ball furthest. So it gives it more of a equal opportunity and there's not a home run every single time to hit the ball. So it makes it more fair for the opposite, opposite team every time. So I actually hypothesized that the wooden bat would hit the furthest because of its density and its solid state. But after research, I figured out that the wooden bat has more give to it. There's, it's not as solid as it really is. The metal bat has a lot more solid structure to it. Okay. And my averages actually turned out to be quite a bit different. My wooden bat on average hit 276.6 inches and the metal bat hit 337.3 inches on average. So that's how that went. Good morning, my name is Lily Crawford. I go to Lincoln Park Academy. Um, I did my project on organic amendments and their treatment on nematodes and weeds. Nematodes are a round worm, and in my project, I am using root knot nematodes. Um, so what I did was I have five treatments. Um, I have a dry control and then a control with organic fertilizer. And I used that, um, the amount of water that I used with the other treatments. So my treatments were cow manure, um, vertisoil, which is urea and glycerol, and then I use ASD, which is anaerobic soil disinfestation, and that would be um, molasses mixed with chicken litter. So after I mixed the treatments together, I um, put soil or plastic on the top and I used two different types of plastic, one being TIFF and one being solarization. So the difference is that one's clear and one's not. So one keeps all the gases in the pot. Uh, so then I waited two weeks and I tested pH and I counted the number of weeds. Um, and vertisoil and ASD had a um, positive effect and there was no weeds. But then for cow manure, there was a lot of weeds, especially in the solarization plastic. 
So after I did those, I um, planted my plants, and then I waited three more weeks, and I tested, um, I collected nematodes, and I took the tomato measurements. I collected diameter, um, stem diameter, height, and weight, and for all of those, ASD and Vertisoil did best. Vertisoil was at the very top, though. Um, so, and then I did spad reading, which is the chlorophyll content in the leaf, and that matters because that is where um, photosynthesis happens in the plant cells. And once again, ASD and control were even, and um, cow manure was lower. Um, so then how I tested or collected my nematodes, I waited two days after I collected them, and then I counted them. And for that, Vertisoil had the um, most amount of nematodes um, with pathogenic and non-pathogenic nematodes. So then on this, this is my graph for the root goals. And it shows that there is no goals in um, the Vertisoil roots. And that's good. And ASD and cow manure were even. But Vertisoil was best. So if I was a farmer, I would use Vertisoil as my treatment for weeds and um, for weeds and the treatment of nematodes. So for my graphs, I used ANOVA to show that there was a difference, or um, yeah, to show that there was a difference, and uh, then I used mean separation to show the difference. So I'm Robert Sanson. I go to school at Westgate K3, and I did my project on the oceanic oil spill solution. And I did this because oil spills are a major problem when they happen. They kill thousands of marine wildlife. They put people out of jobs. It's a very catastrophic and tragic event. So I decided to make a device that can clean oil spills because today's solutions are not very great. Situ burning, skimming, chemical dispersants, they're all either super inefficient or they're bad for the environment. So I was trying to make a device that can clean oil spills more effectively and more in an environmentally friendly way. So I came up. So I came up with a design to do so. It's in two parts, the oil collection, oil separation. So I decided to break it up into two separate experiments. So in the first experiment, I made a device to collect the oil because in the real world, this would be on a ship. So in order to collect the oil, I made this device. And how this works is that there's a pump that sits on the surface of the water. And then at the bottom, there's a plastic piece and that allows two centimeters of space for it to collect liquid, and then there's a weight at the bottom to keep it stable. And that sucks in oil and water. And I did this in calm and choppy water in different water conditions, and I was trying to find out how much water it collect in relation to how much oil, and it turns out it collected water, water and oil in a ratio of 52 to 73 in calm water and 57 to 143 in choppy water, which basically means that it collected slightly more water than oil which seems bad, but that's where the second part comes in, the oil separation. And this device is used to separate the oil and water. So how this works is that there's a hole at the bottom, which in real life would be in the ship, that leads out to the ocean. And this drain, and since water is more dense than oil, it's gonna start draining from that hole first. And on top of that, there's a tube. And that tube goes over the hole, and there's a groove in that tube that allows oil and water to get in. Then in the center of that tube, there's a plug. And this plug is more dense than oil, but less dense than water. So it floats right on that seam between oil and water. So as the water drains, if the plug's gonna go down, and then when no water's left, the plug reaches the bottom where the hole is and plugs it, stopping the flow of water. So that way only water, only oil is left. So as you can see here, water and oil together and then it separates them separate, perfectly, almost perfectly. As you can see, I was testing how much water would remain with the oil, because the goal is only to contract oil. And on average, it, only, it collected only one third of a milliliter of water was left with the oil in calm water and five milliliters in choppy water. So this device was proven to be very effective. And if this were to be scaled up to the size of a cargo ship, this would be able to clean one million gallons of oil in less than one day. So it is deemed very effective in this experiment. My name is Melina Vajin and I am in MOA Prep at Forest Grove Middle School. So my project was on the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect is this layer around the planet that traps the sun's energy and heat because of greenhouse gases. The 
because greenhouse gases are very, uh, there's a lot of them in the atmosphere because of human activities such as the burning of fossil fuels and cutting down trees. So the one greenhouse gas that I did my project on was carbon dioxide. And my question, um, the problem was, do greenhouse gases in the atmosphere affect the temperature of the air? So my hypothesis was that if you add heat to bottles containing carbon dioxide and air, then the one with carbon dioxide will have a higher temperature because carbon dioxide traps heat. So in my experiment, I had a lamp that represented the sun and a carbon dioxide bottle and one which is without carbon dioxide. And then I tested the temperature of each for three minutes every 15 minutes. So and this is the data that I got. So this represents the time and this represents the temperature. So as the time went on, the red, which is the carbon dioxide, and the blue, which is just the air, the red one went way higher than the one with just air, meaning that the carbon dioxide temperature rose faster. So the result of my experiment did support my hypothesis that carbon dioxide's temperature would rise faster. And I just hope that this experiment can help show that carbon dioxide, with so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we can get, we can have rising sea levels, stronger hurricanes, changes in ocean currents, and